the end of Christmas, despite the fact that Neil and I hauled our tree out on December 26th. It had been up since December 1st, so it was time. That's a problem, is that we all get so far ahead in the Christmas season that we don't really have the bandwidth, the energy, the resources even, to celebrate the 12 days of Christmas. But the Christmas season does indeed end with the Feast of the Epiphany, to celebrate when the Magi find Jesus at last. It's a wonderful story, the story of the wise men. And Matthew weaves a tale that has light and darkness, and there are fragrances, and there is quiet, and there is danger, and there is peace. It's all sorts of wonderful elements to this story, but it's pretty spare in its account. It's a very short number of verses, and in those short verses, Matthew introduces three distinct characters. First, we have Herod. Not to be mistaken with all the other Herods that there were, I remind you that the name Herod refers to an entire family. It was a powerful Jewish dynasty that ruled over Palestine for about 150 years, right at the beginning of the Common Era. So from 55 BCE, before the Common Era, to about 90 CE, the Herodian dynasty was in place. Now, in the New Testament, there are six Herods named specifically. I won't name them all because it doesn't matter for this text. We're just dealing with the first of the Herods, Herod the Great. And he reigned from about 37 to 4 BCE, and he was something else. Herod the Great worked for the Roman authority, and he was a builder. He's referred to as Herod the Great because he had his eyes on establishing an empire. Those of you who've been lucky enough to visit the Holy Land or, or tour some of the places in the ancient country of Palestine, you will have seen Masada, you will have seen Herodian, there will be temples and amphitheaters and artificial harbors. Even the second temple in Jerusalem was built by Herod the Great. He was a builder, and he was doing it for a reason. He was a builder because he wanted his Roman superiors to see just how great and important the Jewish kingdom was. His Jewish kingdom. So that's our first character, Herod the Great. Then we have the wise men, referred to in the text as the Magi. Now lots of ink has been spilled, and I'm sure a number of PhDs have been earned, trying to figure out where exactly they came from and who exactly they were. They're called magi, which could mean priests. That word also is translated as magicians in other texts. But given what they were doing and how they found their way to Jerusalem, it suggests that they were astrologers. None of this is actually important to Matthew's point. What Matthew wants you to understand is that they're not Jewish. They come from the East which means they are outside of the Jewish kingdom of Herod. These are people who come from the East, the Gentiles, and frankly, this is the introduction of Gentiles to this miracle of Jesus' birth. Quite frankly, as people who are descended from the Gentiles, most of it's in this room, that means that today, Epiphany is our Christmas revelation. So for Matthew, he's not concerned with how exactly they got there or what their titles were, but that they were Gentiles, that's critical. The third group of characters are the chief priests and scribes. Now these are the top leaders of the religious establishment. And, and they would not have often been together. In fact, it's strange that Matthew calls them the chief priests, plural, because there would have only been one at a time. But maybe Matthew was referring to the one who's currently serving, the ones who are ex officio and any that are to come, and the scribes, all of these people, experts on Hebrew scripture. They know the law of Moses. They know the work of the prophets backwards and forwards. One scholar says it's like saying the Pope and the College of Cardinals or the Fortune 500 CEOs and all their CFOs. You get a sense of the importance of this group of people, chief priests and scribes. So now we have the characters, and here's how Matthew lays out this story. The Magi come and they ask of King Herod, king of the Jews, so where can we find
find the baby that has been born now the king of the Jews? To the current king, that doesn't sound like good news. That means that there is a usurper, a pretender, a threat to his throne. And if we know anything about Herod the Great, we know he does not like that. Herod is king of the Jews. And from the historical record, not just the New Testament, but also the writings of the ancient historian Josephus, we know that he was ruthless, he was powerful, he was ambitious, and he was cruel. Herod the Great accepted no rivals, to the point that he actually executed members of his family, including his wife, because he felt threatened. That's who we're dealing with. Imagine how this unhinged megalomaniac who's holding on to power hears the news that there is a new king of the Jews. Ha <laughs> ha, really? And so he consults the religious authorities, scribes and chief priests. And he brings them together in secret, not in front of the Magi. And he says, okay, tell me, where is the Messiah to be born? Do you notice the change? The Magi come and ask, where is the new king of the Jews? But Herod knows better. The one who threatens him is not some rival. He will take them out. What really threatens Herod's reign is the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. And so he says, where is the Messiah to have been born? And the scribes and the chief priests who never look up at the sky and haven't noticed a giant star, but instead have their nose in the books, can tell him, oh, we know where that's going to be. That's in Bethlehem of Judah, for so it is written. And so, having located the place where it is to happen, and the Magi who have told them that it has already happened, he then sends them off on their mission with the word, ah, be sure to bring word back where I can find this person because I have something for him. So he sends them. And so they go. And there they find Mary and the baby Jesus. And they kneel down before this infant in this humble surroundings with this humble mother. And they worship this child. And they set before this child these precious gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I will not unpack why these are royal gifts. If you want to know, read Exodus 30 and 1 Kings 10. And then warned in a dream, there's a lot of warning and dreams going on in Matthew, warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They go home by another way and disappear. We know nothing of them after that. They have simply come to show that the Gentiles have met the Christ. And that's the story. That's all there is to it. Now, anything that you're conjuring in your mind as I retell this story that involves Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar is the product of the Christian tradition and a lot of good Sunday school teachers. We have filled in the cracks. Any of the places where Matthew has left room for embellishment, we have embellished highly. Magi, magicians, astrologers, well, we call them kings because we want a king to meet a king. Are there three? Well, Matthew doesn't say so. Maybe there were two and there was one who was muscling through carrying gold and frankincense. Or maybe there were five and they'd all chipped in to buy these expensive gifts. We have no idea. But in our Christian imagination, we have refined it down to three adorable children in the nicest bathrobes you can find and the crowns you bought at Walmart. And it's a signal to all of us that we're about done with this pageant. <laughs> They walk down the aisle, they present their gifts, and poof, we light the candles and sing Silent Night. That's the way we remember it. That's the way we have told this story. That's the way we like to tell this story. But my friends, that is not the story that Matthew is telling. Matthew's story of the birth of Christ has a shadow in it. There's a darker element. In fact, Matthew's gospel has a sting to it, and I'll prove it. Let me continue reading from Matthew chapter 2. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! Take the child and mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, and he took the child and his mother by night and fled into Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. 
This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was furious. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time he had learned from the wise men. Then this was fulfilled, what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Ramah wailing in loud lamentation. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. That is Matthew's story of the birth of Christ. It rumbles with fear and violence and rage. If you read on and you read the slaughter of the innocents, you realize that the birth of Christ brings death to others in the same way when Matthew finishes his gospel, the death of Christ brings birth to all. He's a great writer and he's holding these things together so that we understand this good news is not good news to all. It's not. It's not. The one who comes to release the captives is going to tick off the captors. The one who preaches good news to the poor is going to make angry those who benefit by people being poor. The good news comes, and it brings with us a light that shines on us, that shows everything for what it is. Not everyone is happy when the lights come on. A lot of people like to live in darkness because you can get away with a lot in darkness. But when the light comes, one scholar describes it this way, the birth of the true Messiah undermines all pretenders to the throne. Whenever the true nature of the gospel is understood by the powers that be, all swaggering despots turn fearful. That's the truth. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is born, and this world is not suddenly changed. It's just not. It's not like that last scene in Jumanji 1, or spoiler alert, Jumanji 2, that when they accomplish the task and say the name, suddenly everything is healed and light and everything goes back to normal. That's not how this story works. Jesus is born, and the world is not immediately transformed. It is still as it was. But, but there is good news. That's why we read Isaiah 60. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. And nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Arise, shine, for your light has come. It's hard to know what difference the birth of Jesus makes to us in 2020. In a world where there are wars and rumors of wars, in a world that seems besotted with violence. Oh, we love it. And oh, it is bad for us. What good is the birth of a baby 2,000 years ago to us. Arise and shine, for your light has come. So this reminds me of a story of when at the tender age of 21, I learned how to sew. I went home that summer and I asked my mother, who was a great seamstress, if she could teach me this craft I had ignored until adulthood. And so she did. And her first rule was a good seamstress can take out seams as quickly as she can sew them. And she said, don't even begin to sew if you are unwilling to take the threads out and do it again, because anything worth doing is worth doing right. The second thing she told me was that when you're there sewing under that little tiny light of your Singer machine, and you want to see if you've done it right, it's not good enough to just look at it under the light of the Singer machine. My mother would say to me, take it outside and check it in the light. That's when you see that your pattern has gone off, that the plaids don't match, that you've run awry and things aren't straight, and so you'd be back in the sewing room with the seam ripper. Try and try again. 
take it outside and check it in the light. This is Matthew's gospel, in short. The way Matthew sees it is that the gospel is not so much your personal good news, hooray, I'm saved, it's your personal life. And through that light, you now have a chance to piece by piece, stitch by stitch, make the world better. The world is not transformed suddenly because Jesus is born, but you are transformed because Jesus is born, and through your transformation, we can change the world. That is the good news. Salvation, life, hope. It's in the world, despite what the news tells you these days, it is there. And the magic is that for those of us who have seen the light, who are willing to live in the light, through our individual acts of mercy and justice and kindness and courage, we change the world. And it is changed through us. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And if you ever wonder if you've got it right, if you are living in the Christian way, if you are walking the path that God has set before you, take it out into the light and check your work. It will show you, and you can always start again. Happy New Year. Happy Epiphany.